Okay, welcome back to the last talk for today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Pritchard. Uh, Mike is an associate professor of Earth System Sciences at the University of California, Irvine. His expertise, expertise is in next generation climate simulations using new algorithms and new computing te techniques to study clouds and their interaction with climate and weather in high fidelity. He's been using machine learning for cloud physics and convection parameterizations and as a tool for new dynamical discoveries. Uh, over to you, Mike. Thank you. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Can you confirm you can see my title slide? Yep. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, before I get started, I just want to acknowledge some co-conspirators here, uh, Pierre Gentin, and uh, especially these young people who've been doing amazing work, Tom DeGuer, Griffin Moore, Kayla Nicholas, Stefan Rasp, I'll be showing all of their work in this talk, um, and uh, other increasingly uh, important collaborators externally, um, M.A., who we met before, and uh, some of this work will be in collaboration with uh, researchers at UW and Balkan, Noah Brenowitz, Chris Featherton, and uh, I want to acknowledge some UCI computer scientists, Garibaldi and Jordan Ott. Um, okay, so uh, I'm meeting many of you for the first time. So a bit about me. Um, I'm interested in lots of things uh, on the range of global climate dynamics. So I care about things like how clouds are going to reorganize over the remote ocean with climate change and uh, energy is going to change the way it fluxes between hemispheres. Um, and local things that impact people. So you know how rainforests are going to change, stream flow, and uh, extreme events like tropical cyclones. And I find a lot of these topics tend to intersect on issues today of confronting turbulence in climate models. Um, and that's, uh, so I tend to use uh, uh, tools like these, standard climate models, um, especially super parameterized climate models. I'll talk more about those multi-scale models that relax assumptions about cloud physics, lately machine learning. Um, and because of these kinds of tools, I like to explore different uh, computing architectures around the country. Um, and uh, we do a bit of climate model development in the group. Um, and uh, in hindsight, that's part of my heritage, just growing up in a, a cool science and technology center in, in uh, uh, Colorado State University uh, during my PhD. OK, so today I'll start by just motivating my interest in deep neural net emulators from the perspective of turbulence and high performance computing. Um, and then I'll show you, you some results from 2018 about uh, some aquaplanet tests that provoked me. Um, and uh, our recent work trying to address issues of physical, physics-informed neural networks, um, trying to expand beyond this aquaplanet to more realistic settings and the issues that are arising, uh, and uh, hopefully a bit of time to daydream at the end. Okay, but let's just jump in. So my main motivation here these days has to do with low cloud organization. So this is one of the big questions in future climate change. Uh, this is a satellite animation that shows you what you can typically see off the coast, coast of Southern California or any marine step or cumulus deck in the world. Um, these beautiful spontaneous transitions between open and closed cellular forms of convection. And then the processes that mediate that are utterly unparameterizable. And we very, know very little about how that sort of cloud reorganization will interact in global climate change. Um, and that's because these low cloud systems are very delicate. They depend sensitively on the details about how eddies in the planetary boundary layer, which are fine scale eddies, and eddies acting across the interface of the marine stratocumulus cloud uh, operate. And uh, we do have numerical tools that we uh, can convince ourselves seem successful at probing these physics. Uh, you can simulate a small patch of atmosphere at high resolution and convince yourself through animations like these that. Uh, Things like the transition from unbroken stratocumulus to cumulus under stratocumulus that we observe as air vects from colder to warmer sea surface temperatures can be simulated in ways that look plausible, provided you can spend the computational intensity to capture all these eddy structures. Um, oh, sorry, my presentation seems to have crashed here. Let's bring it back up. Where were we? Sorry about that. Okay, and um, and the reason all this is mission critical to climate and climate change is that these cloud reorganizations are associated with the brightness at top of atmosphere, and therefore all fluid flows that are driven by rate of imbalances at top of atmosphere 
should care about cloud reorganization dynamics. So this is the scientific motivation that's uh, driving me these days, these open questions. You know, we know that these shallow clouds are ubiquitous in observations. We know the relevant turbulent processes, what it takes to simulate them. These already are beginning to suggest that future changes in cloud organization might uh, have important climate effects. Um, so turbulence matters. Um, it matters not just to planetary climate sensitivity, but also the regional water cycle. Now, on, on the one hand, we have climate simulations like these today. These are deep convection permitting climate simulations, global storm resolving models that could be run at horizontal resolutions of a kilometer, maybe vertical resolutions of 100 meters or so. And you might be tempted to think when you look at this animation that there are things similar to what I showed you in satellite observations going on next to California, but I want to emphasize that you shouldn't think that. Um, so unfortunately, even today's most high resolution cloud resolving models cannot safely simulate boundary layer turbulence. They're great for studying these sorts of storms here, you know, large cumulonimbus systems, they, these are quasi resolved, but the, the especially climate critical low clouds require grid resolutions on the order of hundreds of meters horizontally, 25 meters vertically to begin capturing boundary layer eddies. And you add it up and it turns out that's 10,000 times more computational intensity per square meter of the planet. So it's really far away from being able to simulate satisfying or doing justice to those physics. Um, so where we stand in global climate modeling is that um, we know the length scales of these important boundary layer processes, but we also know that compute intensity octuples for every resolution dug with two horizontal dimensions and a time dimension. Um, and so therefore, even our most ambitious global cloud resolving models are stuck at these deep convection permitting resolutions. Meanwhile, we have coping mechanisms like high order closure parameterizations, but they're, they're, they're difficult to generalize and, and in many cases can fail in circumstances not envisioned by the designers. So where we stand is like we have to accept these unsatisfying approximations of turbulence in, in climate models. And so this is what really excites me about deep learning emulation, because it might really allow us to extract the information and the, the short simulations we can run of small patches of atmosphere at high fidelity and use it ahead of schedule, rather than waiting for two decades for supercomputers to catch up to the needs. Um, and that's because traditionally our job has been hard as climate modelers. We've had to simulate, restrict ourselves to calculations that can simulate the whole atmosphere for decades. Um, and in that context, satisfying calculations about turbulence seem, seem like impossible. So for me, and I'll talk more about this, I, I only simulate turbulence in two dimensions, of course, resolution in small domains in climate models. I prefer not to. Um, but if the job changes in the machine learning era, just to making short simulations that we'll use as a training library for training machine learning emulators, then wow, that's really exciting. It means that I might be able to do what I prefer now, which is more closer to the large eddy simulation paradigm, large three-dimensional domains with uh, high resolution that resolve boundary layer turbulence. Um, and there's another issue here in supercomputing, which is that um, the architecture of supercomputers is morphing before our eyes. So, you know, it used to be that clusters got bigger just by adding more and more nodes and watts, but eventually it was too many watts and there were physical limits of cooling reach. So, these days, as computers get more powerful, they're doing so using unfamiliar low watt per flop architectures that have incredible calculation capacity that we can't exploit yet because climate models are millions of lines of code and refactoring them to be able to be portable between these new architectures is very difficult. But if you can recast your actual climate model calculation through a neural network as a series of dense linear uh, algebra multiplications, that becomes much more portable in ways that are exciting. Um, so that's the, my, the, the other half of me that's interested in deep learning is to, as a tool to, to get access to these incredible new computing systems. This is an example, you know, 200 petaflop machine that's powered totally by GPUs at Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, okay, so that's the motivation. Um, let me tell you a story about some results. Um, so this begins with super parameterization. Let me define it. So super parameterization is a way of simulating the atmosphere that has two resolve scales. So instead of completely approximating the unresolved details of clouds and turbulence, you sort of sort of resolve them, but only in small little domains that are periodic and two-dimensional and isolated from each other. So, so think of kind of like a, a, a predictor corrector model. A, a global climate model with a coarse grid resolution and within each of its coarse 100 by 100 kilometer grid cells, there's a, a little micro model that actually has a 20 second time step instead of a 30 minute time step and it resolves updrafts and downdrafts and, and there's a, a, a multi-scale interaction between these two resolved scales. Um, 
So that's a technique that was invented in the early 2000s and in the past decade has helped us uh, map out the deep convection permitting regime ahead of schedule. Of course, nowadays we have global cloud resolving models that can handle that more elegantly, but in the coming decade, superparameterization is still going to be quite helpful for penetrating this planetary boundary layer turbulence frontier. Um, and um, the story I'll tell you involves training neural networks based on superparameterized climate simulation data. Um, now, it's, you know, if you want to think about training a parameterization on high resolution synthetic data, um, it's tempting to think of doing it in this context here. This is a picture from Bretherton and Brenowitz 2018 where they took a uniformly resolved high resolution aqua planet and then coarse grained it and tried to train an emulator on that. And that's attractive because it doesn't make this strange scale separation of having fictitious two dimensional planes of turbulence in a multi-scale model. Um, but it's also difficult to think about using this information to correct a model that didn't resolve convection because ultimately you're learning the rectified effects of having resolved it. So what I like about machine learning in the super parameterized setting is that you this, this artificial scale separation that's drawn by design in the model gives you clean arteries um, that, uh, that are causally unambiguous. So there's a, a clear predictor-corrector relationship in the training data um, when you run a model in this way. So the neural network that we'll use in this work is very simple. So it, it behaves like a parameterization of convection. So the inputs are like snapshots of the large scale thermodynamic state of the atmosphere, vertically resolved temperatures, 30 values spanning the troposphere and, uh, and moisture, defining the thermodynamic state, the lapse rate, the moisture of the amount, and the fluxes that drive convection, surface fluxes and, uh, and incoming sunlight. We include the surface pressure because our climate model has a grid that fluctuates along with the surface pressure. And then we just uh, stack a bunch of feed forward crude neural network layers. Um, you know, five to 10 of them um, with more representational room than the input vector um, to provide a lot of learning capacity. There's a couple million parameters in a network like this. And the outputs are similarly dimensioned at about 100 scalars. It's the heating rate due to convection and the moistening rate due to convection as a function of altitude plus fluxes of precipitation and radiation at the top and bottom of the atmosphere. So, you know, this is a local in space and time input and output configuration. But you can imagine that the, um, the neural network is, uh, is responsible for learning the many different convective regimes that can happen anywhere on the planet. It, just like a convection parameterization should be one size fits all, this neural network is meant to be as well. So to, to, as a proof of concept to test this, we ran a zonally symmetric aqua planet, you know, fictitious ocean world that's totally boring. It's got no walker cells, no zonal asymmetry. And we saved uh, very frequent data, every time step of the model, every 30 minutes, the exchanges between each of the 10,000 grid cells in the host model and each of its exchanges with each of the 10,000 embedded cloud resolving models, um, the flows of information between the two resolve scales. We did that for one year for training the neural network and then we did it for a separate year to test the neural network's performance offline. Um, and so the question was, um, you know, it turns out that gives you about 140 million different input and output pairs from each of the 30 minutes spanning a year and each of the 10,000 grid cells. Um, so can those 140 million input output pairs that originated from the actual calculations of a, a prognostic cloud resolving model, all the PDEs associated with that, be fit instead by a crude feedboard deterministic neural network? Um, and after a year of trying or so, we found out uh, excitingly, yes, maybe. So let me zoom in on this figure here. This is the, the main figure. Um, and so this is showing you a summary of an offline uh, holdout validation scale test. So for that second year that we didn't allow to be used in the training process, if we provide the inputs from the host climate model and compare the predicted outputs of the neural network against what they should have been in the benchmark simulation, this is a summary of the error in the R squared metric. So, um, while there are many places like the boundary layer where we don't seem to get any skill, there are important places where we do. So these are in the mid troposphere, in the middle of the intertropical inter, uh, convergence zone and in the middle of the storm tracks. These are the places where convective heating actually couples to general circulation. So they're important regions. We're finding that this technique can get north of 70% variance explained. Um, and that was exciting and um, motivated to doing some, uh, here's another example just of in that holdout validation data set, what the solution should look like and what the predictions show given just the inputs of the host model state predicting the outputs of all the cloud resolving models. 
Um, so it looks pretty good. Um, but a, a much richer and important test of these emulators is to actually implant them then, despite their imperfections inside the actual climate model and allow the, the errors of the fit to also feed back with the nonlinear dynamics of the host, with the, the planetary scale fluid dynamics. So that uh, was a hard test to pass, but Stefan Rask came up with a well enough trained neural network for this aquaplanet to get, to get it to work. So the left-hand panel shows the summary of the climate produced from a long free-running superparameterized climate model simulation. So here's the ITCC and the storm tracks, the heating. And this is the neural network powered GCM. So here are the, the radiative transfer calculations and the convective uh, heat and moisture flux calculations have been replaced with the feedboard neural network coupled to the fluid dynamics. And the coupled system has run out for five years or so. And it's producing the same mean climate. Um, and importantly, behind the mean climate, the variability is what you really want to look at. So um, in conventionally parameterized climate simulations, there are issues with the equatorial wave spectrum. This chart is showing you a summary of 2D Fourier spectrum in space and time that summarizes the dispersion relationships of convectively coupled waves. They're notoriously hard to get right in climate models. So actually, this, this is what all relies on a conventional parameterization that causes it to produce moist Kelvin waves here that are too fast and no variance down here where there should be a lot in the Manajulian oscillation. And a key feather in the hat of superparameterized climate models is that despite undersampling space and uh, limiting their deep convection to small little idealized planes, they are able to capture important emergent phenomena like moist Kelvin waves that travel at the right speed and Manajulian oscillations. And the neural network uh, climate model does the, basic, produces basically the same tropical wave spectrum. Um, but it's, it's much faster to run than the actual superparameter's calculation. I think this model runs tw 20 times as fast as the SP model. Um, and then, okay, so it's important to find out when this breaks as well, and it should break because we've trained it in a boring climate, an aqua climate. So if we, if we uh, add a perturbation to the basic state, here the perturbation is a zonally asymmetric sea surface temperature anomaly, a little warm pool here to anchor convection at a particular longitude. Um, then you know what should happen and, and does in the benchmark solution is that convection organizes itself on that warm pool and just downstream of it. Um, what's cool that is that the neural network powered climate model that was only trained in the baseline aqua planet that did not have this warm pool produced the same response despite not having a Walker cell in its training data. It's anchored convection in a zonal subregion and produced one. And uh, Provocatively, despite these sea surface temperatures exceeding the threshold values in the training data set, uh, was able to run without crashing in this configuration. Um, so some extrapolation happening at the edges, um, but I don't think you'd expect this to work in general. Um, and it doesn't. So if you do something more extreme, like warm up the entire climate by one, two, three, four degrees Kelvin, then what should happen is on the top row here, the benchmark solution, you see equatorial contraction of convective heating and forward upward shifts. And what happens in the neural network powered climate model is that it immediately starts to produce very unphysical behavior um, when it's forced far outside of its training manifold. And you know, there are ways you can think of addressing that by recasting how the inputs and outputs are phrased. Uh, relative humidities are bounded by the same numbers in both climates, unlike specific humidities, and that can actually fix some of this, but that's the topic we're currently exploring. The deeper issue is that most of the time when you couple these neural networks with the climate models, they blow up spectacularly. So here's an example of the neural network producing an insane mid-latitude explosion when it's coupled to the host climate model. Um, and uh, this is almost always what we find, except in those few rare configurations that have produced uh, stable planets. Maybe I'll just pause quickly there um, in case any of that was unclear. Um, before moving on to part three. I understand there's a, a question system, but I can't see what's on it. Um, yeah, could we bring up the slide up, please? So if you stop uh, screen sharing, Mike, Okay, have things piled up that would be worth addressing at this stage or would you recommend proceeding? Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll take a couple of questions and then proceed okay. after that. Sounds good. Okay, okay, the question was how did we settle on the inputs? Um, we, uh, it, why didn't we choose the velocity? So the velocities can matter and the amount of shear in the vertical can affect the propensity for organization. Um, 
the, the answer is that uh, we included them to begin with, but they didn't seem to matter. And uh, we couldn't see any sensitivity to including them versus excluding them. And so we removed them eventually so that we could get away with slightly shallower or less wide input vectors. Um, but that was actually an interesting surprise. It's just unplugging what you thought mattered to the input and convincing yourself because the training exercise works out just as well that it didn't. Um, as a way you can use these, this workflow to learn something. How was the QBO simulated? I don't know. I don't think this climate model has enough of a stratosphere to, to really see a QBO. This is a good question if we had done it in a model that had a stratosphere. Um, okay, I think I'll, at this stage I might just, I might move on. If that's okay. Thanks for letting me see the questions. Can you still see my screen? Not yet. Okay. How about now? Yeah, we see it now. Okay, great. Okay, so um, let's talk about energy conservation. So this is a mission critical for climate change, right? Um, here's a view of the quasi-conservation of moist static energy in the benchmark solution. So that just says that on the x-axis, any excess in the column dry static heating that can't be explained by uh, a residual uh, flux between the top of atmosphere and the surface in, in heat flux has to be explained by a corresponding residual in the moisture budget. So a, a difference between the surface fluxes and the vertically integrated moistening rate. So that kind of one-to-one -one line represents the quasi-conservation of moist static energy um, in the superparameterized solution. And on the one hand, without being told to, the neural network emulator sort of produces the same one-to-one -one line. But if you think about the increased scatter on this graph, it's actually really important. The units here are like units of thousands of watts per meter squared. So if you go and ask how much mass or enthalpy is the neural network leaking um, on a given time step, this is the distribution. So it's frequently in excess of 25 watts per meter squared uh, equivalent mass leak and uh, enthalpy leaks. So totally unacceptable given that climate change is just a three watt per meter squared imbalance at the top of atmosphere to have a convective emulator that leaks energy at this rate. Um, so um, how do you physically constrain the neural network parameterization? Um, I'll talk about Tom Buchler's idea that I think is really nice. Basically, he just writes the four constraints and realizes they happen to be conveniently linear in the predictive variables. So the column energy and mass conservation and the consistency of long wave and short wave rate of heating with their surface and top of atmosphere fluxes are, are the four constraints here. Um, you know, there's standard ways of doing this just by massaging the loss function. So normally the loss function just feels a mean squared error here in our setup, um, but we can put an alpha parameter in front of that typical component and then add another, uh, allow alpha to control prioritization of the column uh, residual in these four constraints. Um, and so that's a way where you can subjectively choose a value of alpha to prioritize versus deprioritize uh, the conservation property. Um, now the issue with this approach turns out to be that um, those four degrees of freedom for column conservation are pretty small compared to the total uh, you know, 60 degrees of freedom for everything we're trying to predict. And so um, you can actually, um, it's difficult to make this trade-off work in the end between the skill that you really need to get by minimizing mean squared error and, and having the really precise conservation that we demand of climate scientists. So what turns out to work a lot better, Tom's discovered, is this, uh, what he calls the architecture constrained neural network. And here you have to go and hack some custom TensorFlow layers into your neural network to enforce the constraints interior to the optimizer. So basically the neural network here has the same input vector, but instead of predicting a full output vector that contains all 60 elements, uh, we subtract our degrees of freedom from that. So interior to the neural network, we predict four fewer elements and then we build up the residuals by encoding the constraints within the neural network to be what they have to be. Um, so one way to think about this is um, if you think just about long wave heating, our model is predicting on the one hand the long wave heating vertical profile and on the other hand also the surface and, long, and upper atmosphere fluxes of long wave heating. And the constraint is that the residual between the fluxes has to match the vertical integral of the profile. So inside the neural network, we could predict everything except, say, the surface value of the long wave heating rate, and then require it to be the, the residual of the must to satisfy it. And because it, you do, you're doing that interior to the optimizer and stochastic down gradient descent is going to drive the whole system to find the decent errors, uh, um, the, the state that you will find will, will have to obey the uh, constraint to machine precision in this case. Um, so it, Tom's proved the concept and it works. and uh, 
it, it succeeds in beating down this residual mass and uh, enthalpy leak to the order of numerical noise. And it actually doesn't change the error of the, uh, the fits to the heating rates and the moistening rates that we need to get the emulator to, to work okay um, online. Um, so that, you know, a year ago, I might've thought this was the deal breaker for neural network emulators, but I, I really think there's a nice generalizable solution um, and if you'd like to read the paper about it, um, there's, a, there's a preprint that explains it and the algorithm and how you could replicate it for any physical system um, and including nonlinear constraints. Um, so that was one existential issue is energy conservation. I think another one is uh, going beyond aquaplanet. So it's fine for this to work in a simple aquaplanet, but we'll only really be interested in it um, as time as scientists if we can get it to work in operational settings like high resolution models with the, all the complexity of uh, geography, seasonality, diurnal convection cycles. So that's a, a much richer training data set. And you might wonder like, is it a fluke that we could learn the aquaplanet data set just because it was so statistically boring uh, and homogenous? Um, so we, we've rerun the training simulations with more modern versions of the climate model that include all of that complexity. And uh, it's been really hard. Um, to reproduce the quality of fits that we saw in the aquaplanet, just as humans turning the knobs that we learned about in the aquaplanet exercise back and off the learning, learning rate, making things wider and deeper to not create information bottlenecks. Those are the kinds of tricks that allowed us to get this uh, decent skill in the aquaplanet. But try as we might, we were, we were not able to, uh, on our own, recover skill competitive with that aquaplanet um, once we included actual complexity in the data set. But then we started collaborating with these computer scientists who do uh, formal neural network tuning for a living in lots of settings, medicine and astrophysics and high energy physics. And they have a little package called Sherpa that uh, spends a lot of GPU hours to find optimal hyperparameters. And it's been life changing. So this was our best fit uh, after a year. And this is after allowing a GPU to crank for a week and explore the space. And so the, the errors are increasing here, or de are decreasing the R square values are getting higher in the heating rates and the moistening rates. Now, um, this is sort of not the best test, I think, of these neural network emulators, is to assess them at the time step level that they're operating in the climate model. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm often more concerned in whether they're doing a good job on the daily mean heating rate if I'm doing climate science. And so uh, there you can see that the, you know, there's some issues getting all the, and you expect the stochasticity to be so much higher at those shorter time scales, but you're kind of honing in on the part of the variability the neural networks can never learn. Um, but when you focus on the daily mean heating skill, it's actually looking really good, um, the structure in the real geography setting. Um, so these are looking competitive with Aquaplanet now. Um, and the, the bottom line is that I guess, you know, it's not a deal breaker to include the additional complexity. Um, I'm not showing it here, but we've also tested that you can couple to a land one way and the imperfections of the fit in the emulator don't destroy the, the one way coupling to a land model. So things look okay enough to be worth a shot at real geography implantation. Here's just a final summary. This is how much more complicated the world looks when you have real geography, one, one view of it. So we're looking at the, the timing of the diurnal cycle of convection. It's got a lot of geographic structure. It's uh, late afternoon over tropical rainforest, but early morning over adjacent ocean. And it's only detectable compared to other modes of variability in certain parts of the world. And the, the emulated world in the holdout validation set with real geography, the fact that it can reproduce the same pattern of the geographically structured diurnal cycle is reassuring to me that um, this, this could work. Um, and maybe just a final point. Um, this is a spectral analysis of the emulator compared to the truth. So the emulator is in green here, the truth is in blue, and we're looking on a log-log scale of the power spectrum density for moistening. So you can see diurnal peaks and diurnal harmonics, and we were wondering if the network is learning anything mode specific, but it really doesn't seem to be. It seems to learn all of these modes and harmonics, um, but it, it, it really just starts to lose skill where the variance is lower. So as you might expect for a, an emulator that's trained with the loss function that's fixated on mean state error, it's uh, only systematic sensitivity are the, the low variance signals that occur at shortest time scales um, and uh, lowest magnitude. But overall, we're sort of reassured this seems to work. So the punchline for everyone here is that Sherpa and formal hyperparameter tuning is really important. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about it, here's a NURBS paper at Hertel. This is a nice Python package that you can easily wrap around any Python code that you've got. Uh, and um, 
for us, I think it took uh, running continuously on the GPU for a week on a 40 gig training data set to find these, uh, you know, doing about 100 different fits to find these well performing ones. Um, okay. So I want to talk about this difference between offline fits and online instability. So that's the other issue here. So reproducibility is a crisis. So um, I mentioned these exciting results from 2018, where we got a stable climate and equatorial wave spectrum to hang together in an aqua planet using a neural network, outsourcing all the physics to a neural network. But it's been really hard to reproduce that, even in variations to the aqua planet. And so um, I've been worried about questions like these. Um, can we reproduce past successes reliably with enhanced training data online? Are these online instabilities controllable? Uh, does the offline skill even predict the online coupled performance? And we haven't been able to address many of these questions just due to a lack of tools um, because tuning neural networks is really painful. It's painful to do hundreds of tests. And translating neural networks, candidate neural networks, into Fortran kernels that you can actually plug into a climate model is hard too. Um, and since these things tend to involve a lot of manual work, um, these questions are underexplored. So I just mentioned one new tool that uh, is helpful for this, to taking the pain out of tuning hundreds of neural networks. Um, I want to talk about another new tool called the Fortran Keras Bridge, which really simplifies embedding those candidate neural networks into climate models to do prognostic tests. So um, this is a new software package. There's a paper under review at Scientific Computing about it now. It basically just builds off an existing open source project by Milan Kirik, um, but with some nice features that take advantage of modern object oriented Fortran to make uh, layer specific definitions that feel a lot like working with the uh, generalized layer structures in Keras in the end. Um, and uh, it's, you know, that's just built as an external library that you can link into your GCM. And uh, um, it feels like basically taking the neural networks you might have trained in Python um, flexibly and reliably, um, parsing them down to some little text summary file, and then in a separate library, um, you know, there's layer-specific logic that handles, uh, you know, even things like dropout or batch normalization. Um, so, from my perspective, in the climate model code, um, wrapping to this library, you know. Replacing my parameterization with an instance from this library is just a few lines of code. You know, I can define a, a structure that's either a single neural network that I've saved and, and pass it its inputs and receive the outputs all by accessing this external library or uh, even an ensemble of neural networks if I'd like to couple to the ensemble mean of a diverse collection of emulators. Um, so uh, yeah, I want to make sure everyone's aware of this, uh, this software because it's uh, changing our life. It's allowed us to actually ask, answer some of these questions about um, whether these instabilities are controllable. To really answer questions like this, you need to be able to test dozens of candidate neural networks in prognostic mode. Um, so I'm excited to share a few preliminary results from that. Um, so here's the first uh, cloud of points. Each of these points is a different neural network that was trained over the course of like a 10 hour GPU training on 40 gigs of this data. Um, using different optimizers and also many different hyperparameter studies. So these are the results of the Sherpa search algorithm. And the x-axis shows you the skill in the holdout validation data set, which you want to get low. Um, and the y-axis shows you the skill in coupled mode. So how long does the simulation run before crashing? And most of these runs crash, um, especially the ones that have low validation or high validation error. Um, but zooming in on the left-hand side of this graph, you can find through the search a cluster of points and optimizer choice seems to actually matter a lot for our application it turns out um, uh, you know a, a, a sort of linear feature here which might be saying you found a sensible physical valley where the offline skill is actually affecting the online performance um, and i guess the key point here is that this is the so far the only solution to the reproducibility crisis we've been able to find so the raspadal you know, for a long time, we weren't able to reproduce the Raspadal aqua planet result um, with minor variations, like just expanding the size of each of the cloud resolving models um, until we tried this approach. Um, so uh, early runs would crash in just a few months, but here you can see these are multi-year runs that are happening after hyperparameter tuning. Now, time to failure is not a very good error metric. We don't want to, you know, we want to avoid simulations that crash spectacularly, but we also want to avoid simulations that run stably while producing completely wrong climates. Uh, so this graph begins to show some glimmers of that. Each line here is a separate prognostic test where we're trying to run coupled to a different one of these uh, uh, candidate emulators. And, uh, you know, some of the, the color coding shows you the offline validation error, the thing you tune 
for, and then the, the, the y-axis shows you the desired behavior online. So we'd like the y value to be low, low error in the simulated mean climate for temperature and moisture. And uh, you know, many of these runs immediately drift to unphysical attractors with very high error and then just sit there for a long time. But I think it's probably not a coincidence that the bluest values here, the, the best trained offline networks are also running stably and with low error. So to me, the fact that uh, the color is sorting the y-axis here and only the simulations that have the lowest offline error are running both stably and with low error um, says that there's really something to this hyperparameter tuning business for our application. Um, so to answer the questions, um, we can begin just now to reproduce past successes um, through formal hyperparameter tuning. Um, and uh, are the instabilities controllable? Maybe an uh, instability that has been stubborn for a long time from a minor variation of this aqua planet seems to be avoidable with this formal tuning. Um, and uh, I guess a punchline is that uh, um, lots of these fits can easily go wrong. So small imperfections in the fit, can, once coupled to the nonlinear dynamics of the actual atmosphere, can easily drift to unphysical coupled attractors. So optimal fits are really important. Um, and of course, the, the big question is whether the same workflow will actually work for the main challenge, which is to do this beyond an aqua planet in real geography mode, and that's something that we're in the midst of exploring now that we have the tools. Okay, so let me move to the final part here. So this is not just an engineering exercise. Um, you know, interpreting the black box is a big part of what we'd like to do with these emulators. So here's a... Uh, a glimpse of neural network assisted dynamical analysis. Um, this plot is showing you the linear response function of convection. Um, this is also the Jacobian that our, our neural network or the, the gradient that our neural network descends on. So the inputs are organized on the x axis here. So this is temperature going up from the surface to the top of the atmosphere and moisture from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. So these are the inputs to the neural network and these are the outputs. So moistening rate and heating rate. And because our network, the inputs and outputs to our network share the same units, we're predicting the tendencies of the state variables we're receiving. The, the uh, response function actually has a units of inverse time. It's a growth rate. Um, this is a summary of the relationship between convection and its environment. Um, and people look at these summaries all the time um, in the convection dynamics literature, um, but they're usually hard won. So the normal way you get a picture like this is by running a cloud resolving model out to a statistical equilibrium and poking it intentionally externally with uh, idealized temperature and moisture perturbations. And then you can harvest the matrix like this from the set of simulations and learn things about convection. So for instance, you look at this diagonal here, all it says is that if you put some moisture at 850 millibars, convection is going to remove it there and spread it vertically. And that's why you see uh, the mixing properties of convection are one uh, dynamical uh, phenomenon that you can read off a graph like graphs like these but there. Are many more interesting convection radiation interactions you can read off the, the right panels. But the point is that this is a familiar prediction that we've uh, produced from just taking the neural network and analyzing its linear response function. And what we can do with that, because the neural network, unlike the traditional approach, has done this for every single basic state in every convective regime of this aqua planet, we can look at how that familiar relationship morphs as we enter and exit the ex extra tropics. And if you did this in a real geography simulation, I think you could have a lot of fun as a dynamicist understanding why convection changes the way it relates to its environment as you enter or exit, say, the Indian uh, Ocean or the West Pacific warm pool. Um, so I don't, I don't know of another way we could get, get animations like these, and I think it's a really interesting byproduct of the, the seeming engineering exercise of emulating convection. Um, um, now, you also need to use your physical intuition to build credibility tests for these emulators. They should be treated with suspicion. So here's one that Chris Brotherton and Noah Brennowitz popularized, which is just like testing our expectation that as you increase the lower tropic stability, lower tropospheric stability of the tropical atmosphere or the background moisture content, we expect um, convection to become deeper and more vigorous with more moisture, and we expect, expect convection to become deeper and more vigorous with lo reduced lower tropospheric stability. So you can ask whether your neural network emulator obeys the same monotonic sensitivities that you expect as a physicist, um, and that's important to do. We, we flagged poorly tuned neural network emulators that required more hyperparameter tuning by doing tests like this early. Um, the other cool test I think that Noah and Chris have championed is 
taking the emulator and instead of coupling it to the full blown climate model, which is the ultimate test of credibility, coupling it to like a reduced set of equations that gets at the essence of some linearized dynamics. And uh, you can do a formal wave instability analysis in that setting and predict the gross rates of modes and flag things like this, uh, suspiciously fast growing high frequency modes that shouldn't be there in reality and uh, muck with your inputs and outputs or your architecture until you can remove them. Um, until there's a, a preprint about that sort of uh, uh, confronting emulators with physical intuition uh, that you can look at if you'd like. Okay, um, there's other interesting philosophical debates raging about all of this stuff, right? What do you sacrifice when you outsource your physics to a black box? Do you, is, it, is it cheap skill? In some ways, you lose experimental process knobs, like you lose the knobs that a climate modeler might like to turn to understand, for instance, how the auto conversion process when it's isolated with a knob relates to broader climate phenomena. Um, if that knob is hiding uninterpretably inside of a stack of deep neural networks, uh, layers, then that's an issue. Um, you lose what we like about our cartoon models of convection, that they represent our understanding of the physics in a human interpretable way. Um, and we lose. But then again, you know, there's a case for the black box when you look at the actual complexity out your airplane window. Um, it, it could be possible that the degrees of freedom of that system are just too big for the human to encapsulate in these cartoons that we wish could explain them. Um, so I see both views of that. Um, you know, it's interesting to wonder what it means that it took two million parameters to fit this relationship. Um, you know, you might say, well, that's not very useful. Um, it, that's a lot of parameters. Um, and, uh, but I think I've been convinced by just the analogy of, of deep learning being sort of similar to incrementally decomposing a complicated transformation intentionally through a long chain of elementary transformations. That explains the number of parameters. It's never intending to be the minimal number of parameters. Um, it's a pragmatic way of, uh, mapping a highly nonlinear relationship. Um, where can we go from here? Well, uh, it's, really, it's exciting times. Uh, I think this is already a surprisingly good emulator of deep moist turbulence despite the imperfections. I'm convinced that we can start to mine short superparameter simulations for their essence. Maybe that means we'll be able to do what I dream we can one day, which is mine actual uh, LES simulations that resolve shallow clouds in their full glory but only if we can figure out how to really grapple with these issues of instability. Um, I think we're just scratching the surface of how we can use these emulators to actually assist our dynamical analysis of climate simulations. It's irresistible to think about what else might be so overwhelmingly complex and involve so many correlations between internal variables that, uh, and nonlinear that it might be worth outsourcing to neural networks. Um, and uh, you know, meanwhile, there are lots of engineering issues that I think haven't even been explored. Um, I mentioned confronting instability. You know, there are ideas that you could do secondary training or gradient boosting to hedge against the initial imperfections of an uncoupled emulator once coupled. Um, that's open territory. I'm worried that most of us are doing these exercises on a single GPU compared to industry. Um, you know, I don't think we're dreaming big as big as we could be in terms of the size of the data sets and therefore the quality of the emulators we could be finding if we could figure out how to to train on multiple nodes of GPU clusters, um, find our overfitting limits, uh, relax the locality and space and time we've been assuming so far, think about coupling to ensembles of our neural networks or neural networks that like variational autoencoders that can in include an element of stochasticity and regime dependence. And so I think there's so much we don't know because of all of these issues about how much scalar generalizability is possible. Um, we just caught a glimpse with a very crude neural network of what uh, can be done. So it's exciting. Um, I think we're, we haven't thought much about how we can tailor the training data that comes out of climate model simulations. I've used the same kinds of simulations we use for science, you know, long serial simulations with a quiescent basic state to do the training, but it might be better to seed diversity intentionally in these simulations by setting up artificial bombs for them. And if you'd like the neural network to learn how to get itself out of trouble once coupled to a climate model, assuming it'll get itself into trouble. So all sorts, overwhelming numbers of things that can and should be done right now. Um, and some scientific priorities. I think it's provocative that, um, that being able to emulate so much of convection's emergent variance with a deep deterministic neural network says that convection is deterministically parameterizable, but we don't know why our emulator does it. So using methods like LRP to tease this out would be wonderful. It's a cool way to think about what more would be needed to make this emulator generally predictable in different climates. Um, so Tom Bickler is working hard on that and having some success just by 
baking physics into how you define the input and output variables in ways that are normalized intelligently to be, to convert the extrapolation problem into an interpolation one. Um, and you know, meanwhile, we're thinking about how to use these emulators to do equation discovery. Um, and I want to conclude with just a final few thoughts on contrasting this whole business to image processing where most of the computer science intuition resides. So in what ways is our cloud parameterization problem different? Um, so one thing is the data amount. You know, I was easily able to generate hundreds of millions of synthetic training samples. And I think a lot of our success in fitting these relationships comes to that data volume. Um, and, you know, in comparison, it's hard to get that many human labeled images. So there's an interesting difference in the data amount. Um, there's an interesting inverse difference in the dimensionality. So the images are order 30,000 values, 100 by 100 pixels times color. And my input vector is order 100 values. So it's 300 times smaller input dimensionality. Um, and that's kind of why I can get away with a, a totally crude deep neural network. <laughs> um, but you know, the fact that image processing is at totally different limits means that there's every reason to think computer scientists don't know what's possible yet at ours. Um, it's really interesting to talk to them. Um, so I, I liked what we were seeing in talks earlier today about ComNets, which is a, you know, necessary when you're doing image processing, you need to reduce the dimensionality of that input vector and flatten it down with these filters. And, and the filters turn out to be really helpful for building understanding and hierarchical representations of the, the first layers um, the building block uh, elements that you see that are gradually accumulated into structures with meaning as you go deeper into the neural network. These are just ripped from Francois Cholet's textbook that shows how the, a cat gradually forms itself out of the building blocks uh, upstream in a convolutional network trained on image classification. Um, but you know, it's, it's irresistible to imagine the analogy here for convection parameterization. Um, you know, there, there ought to be hierarchies of and bottlenecks of dimensionality that should allow us to see what features of uh, the convective environment um, allow the deterministic predictability of the convective response. And I, this is another area that I think we've just begun to scratch the surface of. Um, it's really exciting. So yeah, anyway, if any of that sounds fun, um, come join our webinars. There's a new US Clivar data science working group that's gonna be talking about some of this parameterization business, but also some other interesting statistical debates um, going on around these tools. That's every second Monday at noon Pacific, um, and it'll be broadcast on YouTube. Come visit us at UCI maybe one day, hopefully we can never travel again. Um, and then I'll, I'll just end with a, a core dump of like 10 practical tips if you want to get into this business um, in hindsight. So. One is consider testing and tra training your loss on not just the, the local and space and time skill, but on the long-term daily mean behavior. Um, I think one of the early results out of Chris Bretherton's group um, when they were doing this with course training simulation is you could really improve the emulator if you trained it on its five-day mean prediction skill instead of its local 30-minute prediction skill. Um, know your climate model intimately. Um, before you begin to do this. Uh, so pay, pay careful attention to what's actually prognostic. Um, consider using random forest before neural networks. I think uh, Yanni Yuval and Paul Gorman's attack on this whole business is really provocative. They'll have a nature paper coming out soon and the preprints up, but they've got a beautiful solution that's less, much less crude than what I've shown and, and respects more the actual prognostic relationships of the variables that are to be emulated. Um, you know, go shallow unless you need to. Part of me wants to say that, but also don't be afraid to go wide and deep um, if you can make many samples. So I didn't mention, but we were stalled for almost a year because we were trying to build a shallow network so that we could interpret it. Um, and it wasn't until Stefan Rast came and looked at the volume of training data that we were generating and convinced himself, hey, we could go wide and deep. And we had an information bottleneck and uh, missed a lot of potential skill for a long time. So. You know, it's, there's a tension there. <laughs> Shallow is attractive, but you should try deep if you can, if you can make a lot of samples. But if you do, make sure you explore the hyperparameters thoroughly. So maybe get yourself access to some GPUs. Um, uh, we wasted a lot of time with low level TensorFlow software workflows and started saving more time and making more progress once we got simpler KRS workflows. So I recommend that. Um, and uh, if you can control your training data so that you can uh, produce lots and lots of it and hopefully at time step level output. If you're course screening, uh, course, uh, coarsely resolved in time data, be aware of causal ambiguities. Um, so that 
plot that I showed where the unstable modes vanished, the difference between them on the left and right panels was that they had uh, recognized that a neural network trained on three hourly snapshots of coarse grain data was confusing the effects of convection, emitted the anomalies in the upper troposphere with the causes of convection. So you can get around stuff like that by taking control of your training data and making sure it's as high frequency as possible. Um, and then finally, um, expect that what you learn offline will not map cleanly to online performance. So find a workflow that lets you test lots of diverse networks online. And the Fort Fortran Keras Bridge is one, and I know there's others as well. Um, and uh, you know, think of you know, consider and weigh the the complementary advantages of. On the one hand, you could choose to try to emulate sub processes like just the diffusive down gradient turbulence, where the fact that it's down gradients allows you to bake in a physical constraint that you couldn't bake in if you were trying to emulate everything. On the one, on the other hand, do consider emulating everything because I think uh, these deep neural networks thrive on figuring out the complicated interactions um, between different sub processes. So in our in our superparameters work, we've actually intentionally emulated the combined effects of convection and radiation um, because we found that was more skillful than trying to emulate, for instance, how much condensate convection would create and then feeding that through a deterministic rated transfer algorithm. It turned out letting the neural network do both uh, was less error prone. And, um, and then, yes, please design and test as many tests of physical credibility as possible. And what those are are going to be problem specific. and. Uh, um, but I do think the ultimate test is fully coupled prognostic GCM runs in which the neural network is allowed to interact with the, all the degrees of freedom of the climate model, because that's ultimately where we'd like these things to work well. Um, so yeah, I'll conclude with some references you can look at later if you'd like, just from our group's work, and uh, mostly say thanks. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. Maybe we should switch over to the uh, questions now. Uh, so the question about the double ITCZ being a classic error, uh, did its appearance in the neural network give any insight into why it appears in the GCMs? I can't say. It's well known that these zonally symmetric aquaplanets are very prone to making uh, double ITCCs with even minor variations to the to a convection parameterization. So I wasn't totally surprised that imperfections in the neural network fit also projected on that uh, uh, preferred instability mode. Um, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I guess, you know, related to it, one might wonder whether actually having three-dimensional, um, you know, you know, cloud-resolving models that respected more of the momentum exchanges of, uh, of deep convection by virtue of being three-dimensional and therefore transporting momentum vertically in the correct sense. Um, there are reasons to think that could avoid double ITCCs by um, communicating the speed of the low-level walker jet down to the surface appropriately and causing the right surface stress response on the ocean. So I do think in the long run, um, and neural network emulators could project onto the double ITCC issue by if you know if we enrich the training data to include those physics. Um, what's next beyond subgrid physics emulators? <laughs> Can we emulate a whole GCM? Well, you know that's kind of what we're doing here. We we prefer to emulate the whole physics package of the GCM rather than individual processes within it um, because it's a bit easier. Um, but, um, but yeah, I don't, I'm personally not interested in emulating the whole GCM. I think the, uh, the dynamical core is uh, not that expensive to run compared to convection permitting physics. And uh, yeah, you know, why not uh, use the thing that you already know you can afford to resolve faithfully. Um, but there are people and there's a weather bench competition that's set up around NWP that are trying to just do purely data driven weather prediction. And that's akin to, by, to emulating a whole numerical weather prediction model. Uh, so we'll see how that pans out um, over the next year. I don't think it's been tested much as much as it should be. Well, that relates to the next issue. Have we applied it to an NWP model? Is it applicable? Well, the issue there, um, uh, you know, I am sort of trying to work on this a little bit. Um, you know, there what you'd like to do is, uh, you know, use maybe an assimilation schemes information about the mismatch between an MWP model and actual satellite observations as the parameterization that you're emulating. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe you could get a better seasonal forecast out of such a system. But uh, that becomes data limited in a challenging way because then you're relying on the limited set of samples we have from actual reanalysis or analysis 
iterations. We're down to orders of 10,000 instead of 100 million samples to work with in that limit. And uh, I'm worried that the data limitations, unless we can find a crafty way to do a data augmentation, might mean that we can't do what you can do in the synthetic uh, world. Um, that's a great question. I am aware from the AI conference in Oxford in the fall that ECMWF is applying this machinery in a different dimension you know, to try to um, emulate fictitious ensemble members rather than emulate super parameterization. So their HPC trade-offs are different. They would rather spend a, a tenfold increase in HPC on more ensemble members compared to me. I'd rather spend a tenfold increase in HPC on more convection resolution. Um, but uh, I, I do think there's some success in using UNETs to uh, hallucinate ensemble members um, and give you better NWP PDFs um, with the normal networks. Sorry, my kids are running around. What would be a good example of stochastic parameterization? Um, well, um, so one thing that's interesting about super parameterization is that it is stochastic. So unlike a deterministic convection parameterization, the same large scale weather event impinging on a super parameterized cloud resolving model will produce different responses depending on the high frequency details and the organization state of the clouds and turbulence within that cloud resolving array, which is remembered from time step to time step. So um, now, whether we completely ignored that degree of freedom in the actual training data and physical system we're emulating when we use a deterministic neural network, but you could imagine including it, um, and there's lots of ways to do that with GANs, conditional GANs, or uh, variational autoencoders. Um, so that's an area that I'm interested in going. I think it's really important too for getting the precipitation PDF and its extremes correct. So our, you know, as you would expect a deterministic neural network to be, our model tends to produce reduced precipitation extremes that has trouble getting the tail. Um, and you know, there's lots of ways to think about changing things so that you do capture the tail. Um, you can predict the logarithm of precipitation or bake your physical intuition into the distribution of the thing you're predicting. Um, that can get you a long way. Or there's other hacks like I'm aware of some work at UW that um, has a little classifier upstream that predicts which quantile of the precipitation do we expect it to be in, and then you get a separate neural network for each quantile of the precipitation distribution. But I, yeah, I think the um, a mission critical application for stochastic parameterization is getting um, extreme precipitation tails to be faithful with these models. Um, it's a real big challenging problem. What is my take on uh, Bayesian coupled neural networks? Ooh, I don't have. Uh, not informed enough to have a good take on it. I've only just recently learned about TensorFlow probability from Will Chapman at uh, UCSD and uh, looks incredible and overwhelming to imagine being able to learn uh, unknown distribution on top of uh, um, the scalars. But I'm, uh, yeah, I, I, I need to know more about how the machinery actually works and the, the devil's in the details. Uh, um, but uh, I guess my take is uh, very intriguing. Seems like given how stochastic and uh, probabilistic everything in our world is, we should be all thinking about uh, that class of neural networks that I personally am uneducated on. Um, can I explain more what instability means? I, I think what happens with instability is, um, you know, um, probably, <laughs> it's hard to be sure, but you can easily imagine how a neural network, which is only able to interpolate within the boundaries of the training manifold, um, you know, in, and those boundaries are kind of quiescent in an offline simulation. Then you implant it in the climate model, and something about its nonlinear interaction with the host model drives the coupled system to a boundary, like a temperature that is hotter or colder than any temperature that had ever happened in the in the quiet control simulation that was used to train and emulate it. And as soon as that happens, you're in danger zone. The neural networks are going to suffer to extrapolate well. Um, so you can you can imagine issues going on there, um, but um, yeah, you know, it, it's it's a. I think we're all struggling to know what classes of instability happen in these models, and we're discovering the first informal intercomparison of them is this Grenowitz et al. paper I mentioned, and we found very different instabilities that happen in aquaplanets trained on coarse grain data versus aquaplanets trained on superparameterized data. Um, how does this work compared to the CLIMA efforts to create ML subgrid scale parameterization? That's a great question. Um, so I think our main philosophical uh, uh, complementariness to Klima is that we're, we're really excited about exploring the potential of really deep neural networks that uh, are not trying to get at minimal subsets of parameters of fluid dynamics. So we want to avoid assuming any kind of overarching eddy diffusivity max flux scheme, uh, for, instance, for instance. Um, 
and uh, and we're not really thinking in the uh, data assimilation sense of Klima. Um, so, so yeah, I guess that's the main difference is uh, intentionally explorative of deep neural networks uh, to understand what's possible. Um, yeah, and and I guess the hope is that that strategy could provide us a different pathway to being explicit about low cloud physics that I think we would agree with Klima are mission critical for climate sensitivity. Um, all right, I think this, this might be a good place to pause. Uh, I'm sure there's gonna be lots more uh, interesting questions that come up in the next uh, hour or so. So we'll save them for the panel discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Mike, once again, for a great talk. And I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the last parts where you gave us guidelines on how we might proceed with uh, building parameterizations and what this means for the, the future of AI applications in climate modeling. Uh, so we'll break now for about an hour and uh, we'll have all, all the speakers back with us at uh, 1.20 p.m. Mountain Time for the panel discussion uh, for 30 minutes. All right, thank you. <laughs>